Okay, let's start over. Again, we're talking about President Johnson in Congress. Five days after the assassination of President Kennedy, President Johnson addressed Congress and he asked Congress to complete the programs that had been initiated by President Kennedy. I don't think President Johnson gets enough credit for that. I think everybody remembers him for the failures of the Vietnam War. Everybody remembers that Jackie Kennedy had to kind of move hastily out of the White House and move into the apartment in Georgetown, which we'll talk about and see in D.C. He kind of rushed her out. He did. But things, the presidency has to continue. And I don't think people give him enough credit for going to Congress just five days after the president's assassination and asking them to complete his programs. He didn't have to do that, but he did. Well, the first step in that direction occurred on July 2nd of 1964, July 2nd of 1964, when Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The greatest civil rights legislation since what? <coughs> and the what amendment to the Constitution? 14. Okay. Now, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 required two things. Required two things. First of all, it stated that racial discrimination would be illegal in the use of federal funds. Okay, it said that race discrimination, racial discrimination, was illegal in the use of federal funds. What does that mean, Dave? You can't discriminate on the basis of race when using federal funds. So anyone that worked for the government would have to have equal opportunity. Okay, You could not discriminate on race in any aspect of the federal government, basically. The second part was probably the most important. It desegregated all businesses based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. Again, sex being a more present term, but that would be gender. Okay? So the desegregation of all businesses based on race, color, religion, sex or gender, and national origin. All of those motels, all of those restaurants, all of those businesses that were discriminating against mainly black people, it now would become illegal to do that. It would become illegal to segregate any business based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. That was a very big law, and we'll kind of piggyback more on that later. Now I'm going to give you some other laws that were passed during the time that Johnson served out the remainder of the Kennedy term. Let's see if you, you should be very appreciative of some of these. The first law was known as VISTA, or Volunteers in Service to America. VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America. And what VISTA was, what Volunteers in Service to America was, was a domestic peace corps. A domestic peace corps. Ivan, mean, what does that mean, a domestic peace corps? They were peaceful people. No. What was the peace corps? What did the peace corps do? Shh, Ivan. Huh? What did the peace corps do? Oh my God, are you guys on drugs in here today? What was the Peace Corps, Taylor? Nobody knows what the Peace Corps is? We are not going to D.C. What is it? Okay, I know I'm trying to call somebody that doesn't, but go ahead. Caitlin, go ahead. What is it? Help the poor and under underprivileged in foreign countries. Ivan, what is a domestic Peace Corps? Yeah, a Peace Corps that would help people at home. In other words, instead of continuing our efforts, although we continue, instead of putting all of our efforts in helping the disadvantaged and poor abroad, they decided to pass VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, which was a domestic Peace Corps, to help people in the United States that were poor or in need of aid. Okay, domestic Peace Corps. Come on now. 
The second piece of legislation was the Wilderness Act of 1964. Now, Brady, what do you think the Wilderness Act of 1964 is? I can't rip on you because it doesn't have anything to do with what we already talked about. But what do you think it is? Uh, Very good. It set aside 9 million acres of national forest and national park land and designated it as wilderness. Okay? It took 9 million acres of national forest and national park land and deemed it as wilderness wilderness. Nine million acres of national forest and national park land and deemed it as wilderness. Now, what does wilderness mean, Sage? If it's wilderness designated, what's that mean? Okay, well, what can't you do in a wilderness area? You can shoot, but... You can't build stuff, probably can't take your four-wheelers in there, or your snowmobiles. Wilderness is area that's kind of untouchable area. You're not supposed to change it in any way, shape, or form. Always a lot of debate between the Republicans and the Democrats, because the Democratic Party always is kind of a pusher for what? The environment, wilderness, and the Republican Party generally is trying to open up some of those areas. So when you go up to Boulder Park, uh, you go up to... Uh, that area and you have your four-wheelers all over the place, is that wilderness area? No, because you can camp there, you can build cabins there, you can take your four-wheelers and snowmobiles and all that, but in a wilderness area it's untouchable land, okay? It's to be preserved as wilderness and that's what the Wilderness Act of 1964 did is it set aside nine million acres that would be designated as wilderness. Now, the next three well, the next one, and then there's going to be two subparts that. This next law is very important to you kids, and that was the National Defense Education Act. The National Defense Education Act. You should be very happy with Lyndon Johnson for this. The National Defense Education Act. Now, we're going to split it up into two separate acts. There are going to be two acts that make up the National Defense Education Act, but basically what the National Defense Education Act is it gave federal dollars to schools, colleges, and universities. It gave federal monies to schools, colleges, and universities. Now, there were two specific laws that were covered under the National Defense Education Act, and that was the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the Higher Education Act. So. The third law was the National Defense Education Act. It was an act or a law that gave federal dollars to schools, colleges, and universities. And there were two specific laws that were covered under the National Defense Education Act. The first was the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And the second one was the Higher Education Act. All which benefits you tremendously. Now, let's start with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So if the National Defense Education Act gave federal dollars to school, colleges, and universities, Harris, what did the Elementary and Secondary Education Act do under that umbrella? Did it give money to the elementary Yes, it gave, it gave government money for elementary and high schools to help pay for things like what? School supplies, textbooks, lunches, those types of things. Okay? So the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was set up only for elementary and high schools, and it would pay for necessities such as textbooks, supplies, and lunches. Now I'm going to give you a little modern day synopsis of this. Wyoming is a very well-funded state educationally, and compared to Montana, I'll give you an example. In Montana, we have a thing, and every, every school district has a thing called ADM, Average number belong. Okay? Now, what that means is at the end of this school year, they will count up all the kids in the Washington County School District. And the federal government will give us approximately $16,000 per kid. So if we have a thousand kids at the end of this year, and we had 1,200 kids at the end of last year, how is the budget going to be affected for next school year? You're down 200 kids, right? 
times 16,000 a kid. So that's kind of a big deal. That's, and you're old enough to hear, you'll hear in the spring about how we're in this legislative crisis and they're going to decide the budget and all this business and decide how they're going to fund education. In Montana, when I was in Montana, the best we ever got for a kid was like six grand. So you can see the difference in the commitment in education here in comparison to Montana. So Montana's always in financial desperation. And Wyoming's just starting to get into that because of some of these resource monies that are going away, and there's always a talk about cuts. You're hearing some of that. We had cuts last year. We're going to have cuts this year. Okay? But that's how it works. The federal government gives you each state so much money. Every state's a little bit different depending on how they fund their own state. And Wyoming is a well-funded state. But if you have less kids, and what they do is the population this year will affect next year's budget. Does that make sense? And so that's how it works if you have more kids. And then it's separated. Elementary kids are worth less than high school kids. And elementary is considered what? K through 8. Okay, and then 9, 12 is high school. So high school kids are worth a little bit more, more money each because they think they have higher needs, which they do. Okay, so you guys are pretty fortunate in that endeavor that you are pretty well funded here. We pay for just about everything. And then everybody got a little wound up last year when we were going to cut meals and all that kind of stuff for sporting events and whatnot, and whatever. Taking into consideration, sometimes we don't know how good we have it. For example, when I hear teachers sometimes complain about they're not getting a raise for next year, I laugh because I think about how much I made in Montana. When I came here, I was the highest paid superintendent of schools in Class C Montana. And when I came here to be the guidance counselor, I made $50 less a year than I made there. And then Wyoming has some other benefits. And so teachers start out here at about $50,000 base salary. In Montana, they start out about $25,000 base salary. So I always kind of crack up when I hear that because I'm thinking, I don't care if I ever get another raise. I spent 28 years in Montana because Wyoming is funded differently. Well, this whole thing started for you folks where you had things paid for you by Lyndon Johnson and the pass of this National Defense Education Act. Because what did kids do prior to that? They, well, they went without or paid for it themselves, right? Now, let me ask you a quick question here. Why are private schools not in this boat? Okay, if you go to, I don't know, is there any private Catholic or Methodist schools in high schools in Wyoming? Okay, Billing Central, who we played in basketball as a Catholic school, they don't get this six or seven thousand dollars per student. They have to raise all that money themselves through the church. Okay? And they charge tuition. Yes. They charge it costs two or three thousand dollars, maybe more. If you want to go to Billing Central High School, you have to pay to go there. Two, three thousand dollars. And if you if you want a book, you paid for that with your tuition. You, you, you know, if you paid for meals, they pay for a lot of their own things because it's a private school, okay? That's just how it works. Carroll College in Montana is a private Catholic school. Rocky Mountain College in Billings is a private Methodist school. They get no federal assistance. We're going to get into the Higher Education Act in a minute. But they get no federal assistance. They have to raise everything. That's the difference. So the National Defense Education Act, part of that was the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which gave money to elementary and high schools that were public, not private. You know what? Kennedy would have never got this passed because they were afraid he would give all the money to the Catholic schools because he was Catholic. It was an issue. Okay. Now, the second part of the National Defense Education Act is the Higher Education <laughs> Act, and it's pretty simple. This law allowed for the use of government money for financial aid to college-bound students. So without Lyndon Johnson's passing of the National Defense Education Act, you would not be getting any financial aid to go to these colleges. You'd be paying for it yourself. You see why it was so much more difficult to go to college prior to 1964 than it is now? Because there was no government funding for that. But again, if you go to a private college, BYU, I would think, they, they would be the same, I would assume. They'd probably have to raise the money, for example, in Utah because it's a private LDS school. Those private schools do not get funded. Okay? Any questions on those laws that were passed by Johnson through Congress during the time that he served out Kennedy's term. Okay, that'll take us to the election of 1964, which is an interesting election, where Lyndon 
Johnson is going to run not for re-election, right, but for his own election, okay? <clears throat> now, when we talk about the Democratic National Convention 64, because we had not delved ourselves into Vietnam so bad, there was little question who would be the Democratic nominee for president. No doubt Lyndon Johnson was going to be the nominee. The big drama at the Democratic National Convention was who Johnson would name as his running mate. That was the big question. And it became very controversial, and I'll explain why. Okay? Not on this part, but the Republican part. Johnson made his decision, and he picked Senator Hubert H. Humphrey of Minnesota to be his running mate. So the Democrats aren't going to be where the controversy is. It's going to be in the Republicans. So Johnson's going to be the presidential nominee in 1964 for the Democrats, and he picked Senator Hubert H. Humphrey of Minnesota, highly regarded politician, to be his running mate. Now, the Republican Party is going to have a difficult time choosing their candidates. Okay? And because they have a split in the party, what do you think the split is between the what and the what? Well, we won't call them radicals. We won't get that crazy. We won't even get that crazy. Liberals and conservatives, okay? So the Republican Party is pretty badly divided in 1964. You've got the conservative wing of the Republican Party who are obviously more conservative, and you have the liberal wing of the Republican Party who has a little more liberal views on things. Now, the leading candidate for president was a liberal, a guy by the name of Barry Goldwater. He was a senator from Arizona. What did I just say? Barry Goldwater was a conservative. Excuse me, he was a conservative. So Barry Goldwater was a, was a very conservative Republican, and he was supported by the conservative Republicans as their nominee. But we got a split party, so to ensure that Goldwater is nominated by the entire party, what does what do the conservatives have to promise the liberals? A liberal vice president. Okay? So again, the conservative Republicans supported Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona as their candidate. And to ensure Goldwater's nomination, the conservative Republicans would need to have liberals within the party. Now what Senator Goldwater did during this process is he gave the liberal wing of the party the idea that he would balance the ticket by naming a liberal vice presidential running mate. Okay? And when he said that, do you think the liberals supported him when they went through that process? Because you always nominate the president first and then go with the vice president. The vice president always happens with who the president wants. So they go through the process, and they start with Alabama, and they go all the way through the process, and these liberal Republican delegates support Senator Goldwater, and he's nominated on the first ballot for the presidency. Okay? So he's going to be the Republican candidate for president, and he is a conservative. Well, when Goldwater went to choose his vice presidential candidate, he chooses Congressman William Miller as his running mate. Goldwater chooses Congressman William Miller as his running mate. What is he, Taylor? He's a conservative. Oh boy. Once Goldwater got the nomination, he turned the tables on the liberals and nominated a conservative vice presidential running mate. So, I'll just give you a little bit about politics in the 60s. I'm not sure they're the same today. But in 1960 through 69, most of the country, about 70%, stated they were a member of which political party? Republicans. Republicans. Okay? So if you were a Democratic candidate running for president in the 60s, you, only, you had to get all of the Democratic vote, right? And probably half of the Republican vote to win. Okay, so what do you think these Republican liberals did when it came time to vote? Who'd they vote for? Johnson, if you can believe that. So the liberal wing of the party was furious at Barry Goldwater and the conservatives, 
and because of this, many liberal Republicans actually voted for the Democratic candidate, Lyndon Johnson, for president. Now, to tell you how bad it was, Johnson won 61% of the popular vote. That is a huge margin. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote in this last election and lost the election on electoral vote. So if you're winning 55% of the popular vote, that's pretty good. Usually that ends up like 52, 48. This was 61%, which meant only 39% to Goldwater. That's a butt kicking in the popular vote. It also carried in the electoral vote of the 538 possible electoral votes in this election, Johnson captured 486, which meant that Goldwater only got 52 electoral votes in this election. Of the 538 possible, Johnson carried 486, giving Goldwater only 52 electoral votes. Now, if you're President Johnson, you know you're winning, or you've won the election, what's your next hope? Congress. You hope that Congress is controlled by your political party. In addition to the butt kicking that he put on Goldwater, the Democrats controlled both houses of Congress. It was dominated. The Senate and the House were all democratically dominated, which is going to be a very advantageous for a Democratic president. Okay, take out that little assignment that you have. I gave you, and I'm going to talk about that, and then you'll have an opportunity to get that done tonight. This is kind of an interesting one, so pull it out in front of you so we can talk about, give you a little hint of what I would want here.